Okay, good morning. Um, so obviously I'm going to be making quite a few of these videos now with the um, updated advice from the Victorian government about the schools not going back. Um, so we make the best of us that we can. Um, the majority of the way that I'll deliver my content is through um, the narrated PowerPoints, but I'll still make the summary videos from time to time about certain concepts. So looking at photosynthesis, just to sum up, here are some key points to go through. So when we're talking about it, we often talk about it as the single most important biochemical process on Earth. Okay? Photosynthesis provides glucose and everything relies on glucose for respiration. Every living thing either needs to acquire glucose through doing photosynthesis or eating something that does photosynthesis or eating something that eats that. So everything ultimately relies on photosynthesis to produce glucose, which is then used for respiration, which we looked at in a previous video. So the overall equation for photosynthesis is water and carbon dioxide in the presence of light and chlorophyll makes glucose and oxygen. And we refer to that as an anabolic and endergonic process, okay? So anabolic means building up a large molecule. Glucose is C6H12O6, it's quite a large molecule. Therefore, it being an anabolic process means that large molecule is being built up, unlike in respiration, which is catabolic, where the large molecule is broken down. And it's endergonic because it absorbs energy, and that energy ultimately comes from the sun. So we talk about the sun being the origin of energy for most living things. Last few points, um, it occurs in chloroplasts, which exist due to endosymbiosis. I have another video about endosymbiosis um, online. And just a note that when we're talking about photosynthesis, when we're talking about photosynthesis, we're talking about it in C3 plants. I've only put that in, in case you do some extra reading around it, because there is also photosynthesis in what we call C4 plants is slightly different. Um, and if you're doing some extra reading, you might come across that. And if you do biology at university level, you'll come across that. But at this level, we're only looking at photosynthesis in C3 plants. Um, yeah. Anyway, let's begin. So looking at the light dependent stage, that here is a chloroplast. And I've drawn the two main, uh, I've drawn the structures that we talk about for the light dependent stage, which are thylakoids or grana. VCA are pretty generous here. You can say that the light dependent stage happens in a thylakoid, a grana, or a granum. It's fine. A thylakoid is just one of those discs. So one of those little things there is a thylakoid. A granum is a stack of those discs, um, and grana is the plural of that. But you can use any of them to say that that's where the light dependent stage occurs. They're just membrane discs where um, this happens. So what happens? is light energy, um, particularly red and blue light, light waves, are absorbed by chlorophyll in those, okay? So remember, chlorophyll and um, chloroplasts have a green colour due to chlorophyll. Uh, sorry about the glare behind me, that's a bit annoying. So the um, chlorophyll um, in the thylakoids or grana absorbs light energy, uh, especially red and blue light. That's why chloroplasts have a green colour, because they're um, absorbing the red and blue wavelengths, they're reflecting the green wavelengths, giving them a green colour. So I've got a plant next to me. You can see that lovely green colour there. That's because any light hitting this, the red and the blue wavelengths are being absorbed and then the green is reflected. So red and blue are the wavelengths that um, plants most use for photosynthesis. So that light energy is used to break down water. We sometimes call the light dependent stage um, the photolysis or the hydrolysis um, of water. It just means water breaking down due to light. Um, and it breaks down into oxygen, hydrogen, which is the H plus, and electrons, which is the E minus. So the water is broken down into oxygen, hydrogen um, ions, and electrons. The oxygen plays no further part in photosynthesis. So it just exits the um, thylakoids. 
and sometimes just exits the plant and goes into the atmosphere. Sometimes it's used in plants for respiration, it depends. The electrons go through an electron transport chain, which generates ATP from ADP and phosphate, quite similar to the electron transport chain that happens in respiration, but um, a bit less uh, extensive than that. Uh, you don't need to know much about it, just know that some ATP gets generated in this stage. And the hydrogen ions and some electrons are picked up by NADP, which becomes NADPH. So the ATP and NADPH move into the stroma for the Calvin cycle. Um, and light en we, and just a final point, light energy is the ultimate source of this energy for photosynthesis. So just to sum up a few key points about the light dependent stage, it happens in thylakoids, water is a key input, water gets broken down due to light energy into hydrogen, oxygen and electrons. The electrons and hydrogen um, are, the hydrogen is picked up by NADP to become NADPH. The electrons are used to generate ATP and that ATP and NADPH moves into the stroma for the next stage, and the oxygen exits the thylakoids and sometimes exits the plant fully. So for the light independent stage, sometimes called the Calvin cycle, that takes place in the stroma. So the stroma is the um, liquid gel surrounding the thylakoids. It's the equivalent to the chloroplast as the cytosol is to a cell or the matrix is to a mitochondria. So just a liquid-like space. And here's where carbon dioxide is an important input. So carbon dioxide combines with a five-carbon compound called ribulose biphosphate, or RUBP, and that forms an unstable six-carbon compound that then breaks down into two three-carbon compounds. One of those three-carbon compounds will leave the cycle and become glucose over a series of reactions, the other goes through a series of steps to form back into RUBP. And the energy for these steps are provided by the hydrogen carried by NADPH and the um, ATP, which both come from the previous stage, the light-dependent stage. They revert back into ADP and phosphate and NADP and return to the thylakoids to be used again. Um, and like I say, ultimately we get glucose out of this. That's a bit of a simplistic look at it, but really at the level of VCAR for year 12 biology for VCE, you don't need to know much more detail than that. If you go to university, you'll, you'll learn it in far more detail, learn all the steps of it. Just know the key things that happen is that carbon dioxide combines with another molecule. That then splits into two molecules, one of which goes off to form glucose, the other of which um, goes around to form back into the molecule to combine with uh, carbon dioxide, hence why it's called a cycle. Um, the final thing to talk about in a summary of photosynthesis is the limiting factors. So limiting factors are things that can um, basically limit the rate of photosynthesis, so speed it up or slow it down. So the first limiting factor we talk about is light. And as you can see there, as we increase light, the rate of photosynthesis increases up to a point at which it levels off. At this point where it levels off, um, photosynthesis is not being harmed by adding more light, it just doesn't do anything. Basically, at this point, something else is limiting the rate of photosynthesis. Maybe carbon dioxide, maybe temperature, maybe even water, which I'll touch on later. Next, we've got, um, I've got carbon dioxide as the limiting factor, and it's basically the same as light. Increasing the carbon dioxide will increase the rate of photosynthesis up to a point, after which it will level off. Um, and yeah, again, at the point where it levels off, something else is limiting the rate of photosynthesis. Finally, I've got temperature. Temperature is different to the other two. So temperature, increasing the um, temperature will increase the rate of photosynthesis up to an optimum point. But after that optimum point, increasing temperature is bad for the plant. Okay, so it goes down and down and down and down. That's basically due to enzymes. As we increase the temperature, collisions between the enzymes involved in photosynthesis and their substrates will increase. But after a point, um, the enzymes will become denatured, their 3D shape will irreparably change, and they won't function anymore. So basically, um, too much temperature is bad for a plant. If you think about that, that makes sense. In Australia, think about somewhere like um, North Queensland in the tropics. Temperature typically about 30 degrees most of the um, year round. Lots of plant life there. 
Then if you think about the middle of the desert, where it can sometimes reach as high as 40 degrees, not a lot of plant life there. And that obviously water plays a role in that too, but obviously too much temperature is not good for a plant. You'll notice that I didn't include water as a limiting factor. Generally speaking, if you mention water being a limiting factor, you, you'll generally get a mark for it, but try not to talk about it as a limiting factor. Basically, it obviously is really important for photosynthesis, but it's important for so many processes around the plant that if water levels were so low, they were limiting photosynthesis, the plant would be in so much trouble anyway that it doesn't really matter. So water you can talk about as a limiting factor, but really the main limiting factors are light and carbon dioxide, which will increase it and then level off, and temperature, which will increase it, but then decrease it if um, it gets too high. Anyway, that's just a summary of uh, photosynthesis, and I hope that helps. And um, yeah, good luck for what happens in the upcoming weeks.